In this chapter, we are going to talk about alcohols, phenols, and ethers. Um, these are all important organic compounds that occur naturally and are produced synthetically in significant amounts. If you remember, um, the alcohol um, functional group is the OH group here. Um, the uh, phenol is a benzene ring with the alcohol group. And then an ether, for example, diethyl ether, is an oxygen that's connected to two carbons. Now, um, each of these functional groups are found in molecules that are used in industry or pharmaceutical applications. Ethanol, for example, which is shown right here, is one of the simplest and best known organic substances. Um, the fermentation method for producing it was known and used by ancient civilizations. And a lot of um, kind of chemical historians believe that that was probably the second chemical reaction after fire um, that was, uh, was performed basically because if there's a little bit of ethanol, um, then bacteria doesn't grow in water. Right? And so it was a way to make the drinking water a little cleaner. Then um, methanol is a 10 carbon alcohol shown here. Here's the alcohol functional group. Um, this is obtained uh, from peppermint oil and it's widely used as a flavoring agent. Uh, cholesterol, which I don't have the structure of on this slide, um, but we are gonna look at later is a really large molecule um, that we will find has a alcohol functional group as well. And what we find is the chemistry of all these substances is really similar because they have that same functional group. Um, now, I wanted us to look at taxol. Um, taxol is a really large molecule. Um, this is isolated from the bark of a Pacific yew tree. And in um, 1966 is when it was first isolated, and it's basically a really effective um, anti-cancer drug, but the amount of taxol available from the bark of one tree would only provide one 300 milligram dose for one person, and to isolate that taxol, you had to kill the tree. So to make that taxol more readily available, um, there was a synthesis that was performed to synthesize this molecule. Um, and it, it requires 46 steps, but I wanted you to see that there were alcohol functional groups here, um, as well. And so, uh, the, your book starts off talking about, um, taxol, which is this, this large molecule. And so I wanted you to know why it was important. Other things we're going to talk about, like I mentioned, are, are phenols and ethers, which were used as early anesthesia. So let's give some words to some of the things I was talking about. When we refer to a hydroxyl group, that is just an OH group, um, that functional group on a molecule. And then an alcohol is just a compound that has an OH group attached to an aliphatic carbon atom. And remember, aliphatic just means um, anything basically besides a benzene ring. Um, it has a general formula. of R, O, H, where R just means the rest of the molecule. So what we're really doing here is focusing in on that functional group when we look at the R, O, H there. And so that could be, for example, CH3, O, H, or CH3, CH2, O, H, or some other version of this molecule, but it just means, hey, look, that's gonna be the rest of the molecule. Um, phenols are just compounds where an OH is connected to a benzene ring. And so they take the structure just like that. Um, and then an ether is just a compound with 
um, a general formula R O R prime, where when we look at this, the R and the R prime um, can be the same or they can be different. So for example, you can have CH3 O CH3, and that's an ether, or CH3 CH2 O CH3, where these two are the same, this is called a symmetrical ether, or these two are different, and this is an ether that's not symmetrical. Um, now, for most people, ether kind of generates the images of surgeons and operating rooms, um, but chemists really define ethers where we have two carbon atoms that are bonded to an oxygen atom. So, these are the different compounds that we're going to look at. We also are going to look at thiols in a later um, screencast as well, and those are really similar to alcohols. Um, now, let's talk about how to name our alcohols. So when we name the alcohols, we want to name the longest chain where the OH group is attached. So for example, so for example, if we were to look at this guy, right? Um, this, uh, I'm going to circle the longest chain right here. Right? And the longest chain just needs to contain a carbon that's attached to the OH group. Okay, we've got a, we want the functional group in there. And we're going to use the hydrocarbon name for the chain. So when we go through and count, there's one, two, three, four, five, there's six carbons here. And so that base functional name would be hex. Um, and what we're going to do when we talk about this hydrocarbon name is we are going to use the alkane name hexane and we are going to drop the E and instead add an OL and so that becomes hexanol um, to make that base name. Then what we're going to do is we're going to number the longest chain to give the lower number to the carbon that's attached to the OH. Another way to say this is we are going to number from the side that's closest to that OH functional group. So one, two, three. So because if we if we numbered from this side, it would be a four. So we want to give it as a functional group the lowest number. So then what we would do is we would tell the position of that in the name. So this would be three hexanol. Or sometimes you're going to see this as hex ain 3 all So those are synonyms for each other. Both ways are okay to name. Now, um, a few things to point out here. These are the IUPAC rules for naming, but some of the simpler um, alcohols are known by their um, common names. So for example... This is ethanol, right? But it's also known as ethyl alcohol, right? Um, another one is methanol, uh, would be the IUPAC name, but it's known as methyl alcohol. Numbers aren't given um, when you have the eth or the meth here um, because there's only one place that the OH can be. There's only one carbon here. And then for this one in particular, if we put the OH on the other side, all we've really done is flip the molecule. So there's only one place this molecule can, this OH can really be on the molecule. So we don't get a number here. But for example, if we had this molecule, right, the longest chain here is three carbons, so that would be propanol. And the alcohol is on the first carbon, so that would be one propanol. And this is the IUPAC name, or propane one all, either one is fine. But the common name here would be propyl alcohol. 
another really common uh, alcohol that uses a common name. is this molecule, which we would name as 2-propanol, but the common name here is isopropyl alcohol. So these are some common names that will come up kind of infrequently. Now, I'm sure the burning question in your heart is, what if we have some substituents that are attached? So if we have some substituents, so for example, like let's look at this molecule, Okay. You're still going to locate um, the longest carbon chain, which for us is going to be six carbons right here. I like to circle it. And so that's going to give us the base name of hexanol. And then you need to locate and name any other groups that are attached to the longest name. And you still want the OH to have the lowest number possible. So we are going to number closest to the OH. So one, two, three, four. Four. I can continue to number, but we're out of substituents, so it doesn't. it's not really helpful. And then you put the substituent name in front of the hexanol. So this would be dimethyl because there are two methyl groups there. You're going to use a dash between a word and a number. So this would be, uh, we would tell the position of the alcohol. So it's three here. And then we need to tell the position of the methyls. There are two and four. So the name of this molecule is 2,4-dimethyl-3-hexanol. Um, so what we've done is we've combined the name and the location of the other groups, the location of the OH, and the longest chain to give us the final name. Now here's something to just be aware of. If you have an alcohol that has two OH groups, these are called diols, and three OH groups are called triols, and it goes on and on as far as having diol and triol rather than just the OL. So let's look at an example. So an example would be CH2OH, CH, CH3, CH2, CH2OH. And so if we were going to name this, the longest carbon chain is here with four. And so that would be, butane would be our base name. Um, then we have OH groups that are attached to when we count one, we can either count two ways, one, two, three, four in blue, or in pink, we can count one, two, three, four. Since the two alcohol groups tie, which means no matter which way they count, they get the one or the four, we want to choose the way that gives us the lowest number for the substituent as well. And so that's going to be the pink way there because it's got the lowest number for the substituent. So when we name this, we're going to have two alcohol groups. We would not name it as butane diol here because in naming, we don't ever want to have two vowels or two consonants next to each other. So the way when you are using the, the di or the tri, it's butane like this, di, all, just like that. So that's how we write it out. And then we would tell, if there's a di here, you need to tell the location of both of those alcohol groups. So they'd be in the one and the four position. And then we have... 2 methyl 1 4 butane diol because that's where our other substituent is. So I also wanted you to see an example where we used a di or a tri um, rather than just the ol as well. Now let's look at naming phenols. So um, when we talk about naming phenols, substituted phenols, like we mentioned before, are usually named as derivatives of the parent compound. We looked at this at the end of the last chapter. So, for example, if we just have this molecule, that is just a phenol. Then, if we have a molecule with 
that's a benzene ring with two substituents. For example, like this, we need to tell the position of where the alcohol is and the bromine is. We want to give the alcohol the lowest number, so we'll start numbering there, two, three, four. And what we find is no matter which way we number, one, two, three, four, it um, gives us the bromine in the same four position. So either way, but we do want that bromine to have the lower number if there was a difference. And so when we look at naming this then, we would incorporate the phenol in, and the name would be 4-bromophenol, where it's understood that the alcohol group is in the one position. So with this name, it's understood it's in the one position. Um, if we have more substituents, so for example, Do a BR here and a BR here and a BR here, right? We would still understand this was in the one position, two, three, four, five, six. And so we would name this as two, four, six, tri bromo, because there's three of them, and so that's why we show those three numbers phenol. So that's how the numbering would uh, look with this particular compound. Now, the characteristic chemistry of an alcohol sometimes depends on the groups bonded to the carbon atom that has the hydroxyl group here. Um, when, we, when we talk about this, we do refer to this sometimes as a hydroxy group. Okay, um, and so we classify these alcohols as primary, secondary, or tertiary. A primary alcohol is attached to a carbon with one R group. And remember, the R group is just the rest of the molecule. Then a secondary alcohol here is attached to a carbon that's attached to two R groups. And then a tertiary alcohol is attached to a carbon that's attached to three R groups here. Here are specific examples that are shown below. And these, depending on if an alcohol is primary, secondary, tertiary, that affects its chemistry. So you will need to be able to identify if an alcohol is primary, secondary, or tertiary. Now, let's talk about some properties of alcohols um, and compare those to linear alkanes that we've learned about previously. Um, When we think about alcohols and we, we look at the structure of water, water looks like this. And to get to an alcohol, what we've done basically is we've replaced one of those hydrogens with a R group. So for example, there is the R group that's attached. And so because of this, what happens is that al some alcohols still have properties that are really similar to water. So for example, lower molecular weight alcohols like methyl ethyl propyl and isopropyl right are completely miscible in water When we talk about something being completely miscible, all that means is it mixes completely. Now, one of the things we notice, if we look at this graph, this has water solubility, which just means how, how well something kind of mixes versus the number of carbon atoms in a molecule. 
So methanol, ethanol, uh, propyl, and isopropyl are way up here. And then what we start noticing is as we add more carbons to the alcohol, it tends to resemble an alkane more than it resembles water. And alkanes are not soluble in water. And so when we get to these higher kind of ratios of carbon to the alcohol group, we be it, these alcohols become insoluble. So for example, right, um, one heptanol is not soluble in water at all. Now, so let me put some words to that. Long chain alcohols are not soluble in water, right? And in fact, would be soluble in nonpolar solvents like benzene, carbon tetrachloride, right, and ether. Okay. Now, um, we can predict the solubility based on the number of carbon atoms per hydroxy group in a molecule. And so one hydroxy group can solubilize three to four carbon atoms. Right? And so the high solubility of the lower molecular alcohols in water um, is due to hydrogen bonding. So just to summarize, um, lower molecular weight alcohols are going to be soluble in water. Higher molecular weight alcohols are not going to be soluble in water, um, but soluble in nonpolar solvents. And one of the ways to tell is that one hydroxy group can solubilize three to four carbon atoms. So what I also mean by this is if you look at this molecule, this molecule has two alcohol groups to five carbon atoms. Um, and so when we, when we look at that, we can say, okay, that one alcohol can solubilize these three, and then this alcohol over here can solubilize these two, and so then we could predict that this would be soluble in water because each hydroxy group can solubilize three to four carbon atoms. So what happens here is, as I mentioned before, um, the solubility of, of alcohols in water depend on the number of car, uh, carbon atoms per hydroxy group. Um, and I wanted us to see the hydrogen bonding um, that is responsible for this solubility. Now let's look at the um, long chain alcohol group that's shown over here. What you're going to notice here is that this part does not form any hydrogen bonds with water. And so what happens then is it's actually hydrophobic, which of course means um, water uh, fearing. So it's not going to have any interactions with water. So because we say this portion, because it doesn't have any interactions with water, we then can make the conclusion that this is the part that's insoluble in water. 
And so because this length here is more than three or four carbons, the whole molecule itself is insoluble, even though we do have a little hydrogen bonding here with the OH group. So it's kind of like when you're looking at this, which one's going to win? And the hydrophobic part wins if it's greater than three or four. And then the hydrophilic part, which is the part that interacts with water, wins if it's less than three or four carbons. Now, the um, one of the things that we're going to see is that the OH group can make hydrogen bonds between the alcohol uh, molecules, and that also leads to relatively high boiling points. So alcohols have relatively high boiling points. compared to alkanes and ethers because of hydrogen bonding. So these atoms can hydrogen bond within themselves. And so that is what gives us that increase here as far as the um, the, mo the molecular weight. So in this screencast, we've introduced alcohols, phenols, and um, ethers. And then we've talked specifically about how to name alcohols and some properties of the um, alcohols. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop by my office.